sorry i'm just joining i've been trying to log in like for the past five minutes but no voila i'm here um i i dropped like two different yeah, materials good afternoon. good afternoon good afternoon i dropped like two different materials on a group chat i don't know whether we've seen it yes okay i don't know whether we've downloaded them yes we have okay ah god no problem so i will try to share my screen now so that we can move we can move so when are we ending the class 6 p.m 6, 6, 6 p.m 6 <laughs> okay somebody said 8 p.m let's see as we go let's start let's start okay okay um jamie was able to do is 10 today now abby yes, yes. Eight. yes. okay okay no problem no problem so let's start so you can open the material if you are ready i'm ready so i, I will share my screen shortly so any topic i want to pick now i will do a general overview so if you have questions, you can ask me before we now start to solve questions. Can you see my screen from your hand? Yes, Hello, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. I want to start with IS-36, IS-36 impairment of assets. Uh, let me just tell you the page. I think it's towards the end of the material. So you can, put, you can put on page 11, page 11, IS 36, IS 36. So before I start to solve question, let me just do a general overview of that topic. Impairment of assets, impairment of assets. Okay, so when I say impairment, what does it mean? An asset is said to be impaired whenever the current value of the asset is more than the recoverable value of the asset. Please, if you have question, you can just let me know because I may not be able to see you raising up your hand, given the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm presenting a Word document. So I may not know if you are actually raising up your hand. So you can just let me know if you have a question or any clarification. Okay, so an asset is said to be impaired whenever the current value of the asset is more than the recoverable value of the asset. So the question is, what is the current value? Current value is the book value in the financial statement. So depending on the asset, depending on the accounting policy adopted, current value can be the cost of the asset minus accumulated depreciation, or the cost of the asset minus accumulated impairment, uh, minus accumulated amortization, or the revalued amount of an asset minus depreciation of the asset. That is the current value. So literally, current value means the book value of an asset. So the asset will set to be impaired whenever the book value of the asset is more than the value that can be recovered from the asset. So impairment compares two different figures. The first figure is the current value, and the second figure is the recoverable value. When I say recoverable value, what does it mean? Recoverable value is the higher of the value in use of an asset and the fair value less cost to sell the asset. That means recoverable value has two different elements. Number one, value in use of an asset. And number two, fair value less estimated cost to sell the asset. So let me pick the first one, which is the value in use. When I say value in use, what does it mean? Value in use, I'm still looking at the asset from the perspective of continuous use of the asset. So value in use is a present value of estimated cash flows that can be generated from the continuous use of an asset. 
Those cash flows are both cash inflows. Example of cash inflows is the revenue I can generate from the assets and the residual value of the assets at the end of the estimated useful life of the asset. So those cash flow, we take into consideration both cash inflow and cash outflows. Cash outflow in form of repairs, cash outflow in form of maintenance of the asset, cash outflow in terms of the service of the asset, and cash outflow in terms of the, the commissioning cost on that asset. So the, 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 the figure I'm going to discount to present value is the net cash flow. And when I say net cash flow, what do I mean? I mean cash inflow minus cash outflow. So the discounted value in my financial statement becomes value in use. On the other hand, we have what we call fair value less estimated costs to sell the asset. And what does that mean? If I'm looking at the asset from the perspective of selling the asset, what is the market value minus any cost I need to incur for the purpose of selling the asset? So the higher between the fair value less estimated cost to sell and the value in use becomes what we call recoverable value. So if I have an asset that has a current value of $5 and the recoverable value of the asset is $3, Given the fact that the current value is more than the recoverable value, the excess of that two dollars or two million dollars represents an impairment loss. I don't know whether you have a question before I proceed. Any question at this junction? Okay, so I can zoom, I can proceed. The question is if I impair an asset. If I impair an asset, what should be the accounting treatment for that impairment loss? Ideally, impairment loss should be recognized in profit or loss as an expense. So what do I need to do? I will debit profit or loss as an expense. I will credit the asset, which will reduce the current value of the asset. However, if the asset of assets for impairment is an asset that I carry that revaluation, for example, an asset like PPE, an asset like intangible asset that can carry at revaluation model. What the standard requires is that impairment law should not be recognized in profit or loss. That impairment law should be treated as a reduction in revaluation of the asset. So what does that mean? So that means I will debit other comparative income to reduce the revaluation surplus I'm carrying in my equity and the credit leg is against the assets to also reduce the current value of the assets. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is sometimes we can have an asset that on its own, it does not generate cash flow on its own. In IS 36, what do we call that asset? Any asset that doesn't generate cash flow on its own, we call it corporate assets. So corporate asset in IS 36 is an asset that on its own does not generate cash flow that will be free from other assets. That means the asset will only generate cash flow if and only if I use the assets together with some other category of asset. But on its own, it doesn't generate cash flow to me. I call the asset corporate asset. Please take note of that. So if I have a corporate asset, that's a challenge. And the challenge is, it may be difficult for me to determine the value and use of that asset, given the fact that the asset does not generate cash flow that is independent from other assets. So what the standard requires is, that corporate asset should be grouped together with some other asset that can generate cash flow that are free from other assets. And that is the major reason in IS 36, we have the concept we call cash generating units. And what does it mean by CGU, card generating unit? It implies the smallest identifiable group of assets that can generate cash flow, which are independent from other assets. So depending on the circumstances, a CGU can represent a unit in an organization. A CGU can represent a branch. A CGU can represent a geographical location. A CGU can represent a department within an organization. 
So, if I pay a CGU, remember, CGU is made up of different assets, and sometimes it can have liability as well. So, if I pay a CGU, I will have a single impairment loss. So, the major challenge is how do I know after the impairment loss which one relate to the component or the asset within the CGU? There is a principle in IS 36 that says whenever you impair a CGU, we have principle for the purpose of allocating the impairment loss to all the assets within the CGU. And the first principle says 100% should be allocated to an obviously impaired asset. Examiner may not tell you an asset is obviously impaired. The question is, how do I identify an asset that is obviously impaired? An asset can be obviously impaired if the asset has been destroyed, if the asset has been damaged, if the asset does not have an active market any longer. In that case, that means the asset is an obviously impaired asset. So the principle says 100% should be allocated to an obviously impaired asset. <clears throat> After doing that, 100% should be allocated to goodwill. After doing that, the remaining figure after doing number one and number two, should be allocated to the assets that are remaining on pro rata basis, excluding current assets. Excluding current assets. I don't know whether you have a question for me or I can proceed. <clears throat> Hello? Please, can you say again how to allocate it? I didn't quite get it. I can't hear you. I said, please, can you take that again? How to allocate the impairment for a car generating unit? I didn't get the the process you were explaining. I didn't get it. Okay. The first one states 100% should be allocated to an obviously impaired asset. And I told you, examiner may not tell you this asset is obviously impaired. Examiner can tell you the asset has been destroyed, the asset has been damaged, the asset does not have active market any longer. What does that imply? It implies the asset is an obviously impaired asset. When I've allocated 100% of the current value to an obviously impaired asset, the next thing for me to do, if there is still a remainder, is to allocate 100% of goodwill to goodwill. After doing that, if there is still a remainder, the remainder should be allocated to the remaining asset on pro rata basis, excluding current assets. On pro rata basis, excluding current assets. So are you fine now? Okay, so I believe you are fine. So let me move on. Okay, the next thing I would like to talk about is reversal of impairment loss, reversal. There's a principle in IS-36 that says whenever the major is the Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hello. hear you now. I can hear you now, but you are breaking. Yeah, is it better now? Is it better? It's better now. Yes. Yes. Sorry about that. Okay, I was trying to explain something. Uh, okay, I was trying to explain reverse of impairment loss. And I said, <clears throat> whenever the new recoverable value of the asset has improved, IS 36 requires that I can reverse previously recognized impairment loss. 
And for the purpose of reversal of impairment, there are principles that I need to follow. Number one principle says, number one principle says, no impairment is permitted, no reversal is permitted on goodwill. So what does that mean? Once I've impaired goodwill, I cannot reverse impairment loss on goodwill. That is number one. And number two says, number two says, the carrying value after the reversal should not be more than the carrying value of the asset, assuming the asset was never impaired. Let me come again. The carrying value after the reversal should not exceed the carrying value of the asset, assuming the asset was never impaired. So those are the principles that need to be followed for the purpose of reversing impairment loss. What else do I need to talk about? I need to talk about identification of impairment loss. How do I identify an asset that is impaired? I can identify an asset that is impaired based on indicators of impairment. Indicator can be internal, indicator can be external. Example of internal indicator of impairment of an asset is evidence of obsolescence of the asset, or when an asset has been physically damaged, or when there is adverse change in the use of the asset, or when there is a reduction in the economic performance of the asset. In that case, it means those are the internal indicators of impairment of the asset. And the next one is external indicator. External indicator can include a fall in the asset market value that is more significant than the normal fall which may be due as a result of passage of time. Another example of external indicator is a significant change in technological market, legal or economic environment of the business in which the assets are employed or an increase in market interest rate or a market rate of return on investment which we have fed a discount rate to be used for the purpose of calculating the value and use of the assets. And whenever the current amount of the, of the entity net asset is more than the market capitalization. All these are examples of external indicators of impairment. And remember, there are some category of assets that I don't impair them because the indicator, but the standard required that every year, whether or not I see indicators of impairment, I must always assess them for impairment. And a good example of this asset include goodwill and other intangible assets with indefinite useful lives. Any question? Okay, so let's start now. Somebody should read for me. Who is reading? Hello? Okay, I'll read, sorry. Okay, Alex, sorry, you, I can hear you. Number one, a business which, which comprises a single cash generating unit has the following assets. Good be $1 million, patent $5 million, property $10 million, plant and equipment $15 million, and net, asset, net current assets $2 million. Following an impairment review, is estimate it is estimated that the value of the patent is $2 million and the recoverable amount of the business is $24 million. And what amount should the property be measured following the impairment review? Okay, so let me try to open my exam. Let me open my exam so that I can see the computation on the exam. So the next thing I need to do is to try and copy the question.
Okay. So let's solve now. For the CGU, I have goodwill. I have patent. I have property. I have plants and equipment. I have net current assets. So let me say carrying value before impairment. Allocation of impairment loss. Carrying value after allocation. So for the goodwill, how much is goodwill? Three, five, ten, fifteen, two. So three, five, ten, fifteen, two. What's the total? Total gives me thirty five. 35 million. What is recoverable value? 24. 24. How much is my impairment loss? My impairment loss is 35 minus 24. 11. 11. Okay. The principle says 100% to be allocated to an obviously impaired asset. That's the principle. In this question, there is an obviously impaired asset, and the obviously impaired asset is two million. Ah, it's patent, it's patent. But the question here is telling me that I should not follow the principle 100%. What this one is saying is, Said, don't allocate 100% an obviously impaired asset. Even though patent is said to be obviously impaired asset, the recoverable value of patent is two million. That means made the carrying value of the patent to be two million. That's what that one is saying. So if I've made the carrying value of patent to be two million, that means I've only allocated the difference of two of five and two to patent, which is three. Out of eleven million, I've used three million, remaining eight million. What is the second principle? 100% to be allocated to goodwill. How much is goodwill? Three. How much is remaining? Eight. Automatically, three can be taken against three to ensure the current value is zero. How many assets are remaining? Three. What are the assets that are remaining? Property, number one. Plant and equipment, number two. Net current asset, number three. However, the standard requires that for the purpose of allocating impairment loss to CGU, please disregard current asset. So automatically, that means this guy will be zero and the current value for this guy will remain two. So how many assets are remaining for me to allocate to? They are just two. What are those two? Property and plant and equipment. So the standard required that I should do the allocation based on pro rata basis. How much was the total impairment loss? 11 million. How much have I allocated? 6 million. How much will be remaining? 5 million. What is the carrying value of property? 10. What is the total carrying value of the property and plants and equipment? It's 10 plus 15, which will give me 25. So what do I do? I will say 10. 10 divided by 25, multiply by 5. Multiplied by 5. 
So this will give me two. That means the counting value here is 10 minus two. Which give me eight. This guy will give me 15 divided by 25 multiplied by five. This guy will give me 10, 15 minus three will give me 12. So if I add up this guy, it must give me 11. Fantastic. If I add up this guy, it must give me 24. Fantastic. So what is the question talking about? What is the amount that should be, that should, what amount should the property be measured following the impairment law? This is property. What should be the figure? The figure is 8 million. Hello? Hello? Hi. Any question? Yep. Yep. Okay. Let me go to the next one. Somebody should read question number two. The net, uh, sorry, number two. The net asset of Fingo, of Fingo is a car generating unit, uh, property and equipment, 200,000, allocated goodwill, 50,000, product patents, 20,000, net current asset, a realizable value, 30,000. As a result of adverse publicity, Fingo has a recoverable amount of only 200,000. What will be the value of Fingo's property? And what, what will be the value of Fingo's property, plant, and equipment after the application of the impairment loss? Okay. Thank you. Let me save this exact so that I can share it after the class. So I have PP, I have Goodway, I have Patent, I have Net Current Asset. PP is 200 and 23. Goodwill 50 and 23. Patent 20, 1, 2, 3. Current asset, 30, 1, 2, 3. This is current value. Impairment. Allocation. Payment loss. It is counting value after allocation. <clears throat> the principle says, okay, how much is the recovery value? 200. So that means the impairment loss will be 100. That is the meaning. The principle says 100% are an obviously impaired asset. In this question, I don't have obviously impaired asset, so I will go to the next one. 100% of goodwill. How much is this guy? 50. How much is my impairment loss? 100. That means I can do the entire 50 against 50. This one will be zero. How many assets are remaining? One, two, three. But the net current asset needs to be excluded. Definitely, that means I will not allocate anything this guy will remain 
thirty. I'm, I'm left with patent and PP, and they are to be allocated on prorata basis. So how do I do the prorata? I will say 200 divided by the combined 220, which is 220, multiplied by 50. This one is 20 divided by the combined 220 multiplied by 50 one two three so let me put minus in front of it minus 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 so this plus this guy. I'll just drag down. Okay. The question is asking me for PP. PP. Any question? Are we fine? Hello? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, we are fine. Sorry. Yes, sir. We are fine. The third question. Okay, number three. Which of the following is not an indicator of impairment under IAS 36, impairment of assets? A. Advances in, in the technological environment in which an asset is employed have an adverse impact on its future use. B, an increase in interest rates which increases the discount rate an entity uses. C, the current amount of an entity's net assets is lower than the net entity's number of shares in issue multiplied by its share price. D, the estimated net realizable value of inventory has been reduced due to fire damage, although this value is greater than its current amount. Okay, so what's the answer? B. Eh? 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 It's not an indicator. It's not. It's not oh. an indicator. I see. B. Which of these is the indicator? D. D for Denmark. Denmark. D for Denmark. C for that. C for that. Or C for Canada. D. C for that. D for Denmark. Yeah, let me show you something. Let me show you something. D. Don't worry. Don't worry. Somebody should read this external from number one to number four. Number one, external sources of information, a fall in the assets market value that is more significant than would normally be expected from passage of time over normal use. Two, a significant change in the technological market, legal or environment or economic environment of the business in which the assets are employed. An increase in market interest rates or market rates of returns. Mm -hmm. On investments likely to affect the discount rates used in calculating the value in use. The current amount of the entity's net assets being more than its market capitalization. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to the question. So what was now the answer? Canada. D for Denmark. Eh? D. D for Denmark. D. D for Denmark. D for Dublin. <laughs> okay. Do I agree that the answer is D? Who can tell me why? Why is the answer D? Why is the answer D? Because the oh. um, NLV oh, is now um, greater than selling amounts, so you can't pay it. Okay. Eh? You said what? Because the net realizable value is greater than the carrying amounts. Okay. Okay. But let me not tell you the answer. The answer to this question 
is C for Canada. So ask me a question. Okay. Canada all the way. Eh? I know uh, Canada and I would go. <laughs> okay. How? How you can hear him? Explain, please. Let, let me explain. Let me explain. Let me explain. Yeah, but I think I told, I think I was one that treated this topic and I told you when I did this topic. <laughs> let me tell you something. Let me tell you the secret. The secret is highest 36. Okay. Before I even tell you the secret, impairment, what does it mean? Impairment means what I'm carrying in my financial statement should not be more than what I can recover from the asset. That is it. In IFRS today, in IFRS today, that principle of impairment applies to all categories of assets. Let me come again. That principle of impairment applies to all category of assets. However, IS 36 does not apply to inventory. I treated IS2 with you, inventory. Inventory is saying that what I should recognize in my financial statement as inventory should be the lower of the cost and their net realizable value. I was even expecting a question that said, when you were telling us allocation of impairment loss to CGU, why will you, why will you tell me that for the purpose of allocating the remainder on the assets remaining, I should exclude current asset? I was even expecting that question. Now, why do I need to exclude current asset? The major reason why I need to exclude current asset is Whichever example of current asset you want to give to me, it also goes through a process that looks like an impairment, even though it may not be impairment in accordance with IS 36. For example, inventory goes through something similar to impairment principle in IS 36. However, IS 36 does not apply to inventory. What applies to inventory is IS2. And the principle in IS2 says that in no circumstances should the value in your financial statement of inventory be more than the net realizable value of inventory. So what is, what's the answer here? The answer is C. Why is the answer C? Because examiner specify that which of the following is not an indicator of impairment under IS36 and IS36 does not apply to inventories. Oh, okay. Sorry, can, can we make the same assumption for, um, uh, what is it called, assets um, to be under discontinued operations, assets held for sale? You say what? Can you come again? Okay, can we make the same conclusion? Very good, very good, very good. Under 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 non current asset held for sale, I do something similar to impairment, but IS thirty six does not apply. And that's it. If I have trade receivable, I also do something similar to impairment, but IS thirty six does not apply. And that's it. So can we move? Question four. Okay. The finance Hello? has. Yes, yes. What's the question? Is saying IS that is apply to inventory? Mhm. Mm oh yeah, it now ask your question. Hello. Tron in D has to do with inventory. So ah, if okay. six doesn't apply to inventory, then it should be D now. Wait, 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 wait. Listen to the question very well. Which of the following is not an indicator of impairment under S36? An advance in technological environment. It's an indicator, I told you. An increase in interest rate is an indicator. I told you the current amount of an entity net asset is lower. No, it's not lower. It is higher. 
When it is higher, it becomes an indicator. When it is lower, it's not an indicator. And this D, IS36 doesn't apply to D. A, B, C, IS36 applies to it, but C in this case is not correct. C is not correct because for me to say it's an indicator of impairment, the canning amount of the net asset must be higher than the number of share multiplied by the share price. So what makes C not to be an answer is because they put lower here. It must be higher. I showed you, look at it now. Look at it here. The carrying amount of the entity net asset being more than its market capitalization, not less than the market capitalization. So D doesn't apply to IS36. And that's what I'm saying. Yes, so are you fine? Okay, the next question. Oh yeah, the next question. The director has been asked to report to the board on the reasons for the impairment review on the cash generating unit. Which two of the following? would be an internal indicator of impairment of an asset under IS-36, impairment of assets. One, okay. market value of the asset has fallen significantly. There are other to the use to which the asset is put. The asset is fully depreciated. The operating performance of the asset has declined. So what's the answer? B and D. Yeah. Number five, the machine has a carrying amount of it's five thousand dollars at the end of the first March twenty X nine. This market value is thousand and cost of disposal is a cost of disposal is estimated at twenty two thousand five hundred. It cost around fifty thousand. The company which expects it to produce net cash flows of thirty thousand per annum for the next three years has a cost of eight percent. What is the impairment loss on the machine to be recognized in the financial statements at that percent? Thank you. Okay, the next question. Remember, I told you that for impairment, the carrying value to an asset is said impaired whenever the carrying value exceeds the recoverable value. So the carrying value here in this question is how much in this question? Eighty five million, eighty five thousand. Do we agree? Oh, my people are not talking again. Hey. Yes, we agree, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. We are here. Yes. We are here, Mr. Said. Recoverable eh? value based on the principle is the higher, the higher of value in use and fair value less cost to sell. Fair value less cost to sell. How do I determine that? Who can now tell me? Who can tell me? How to determine fair value less estimated cost to sell? Who can tell me? Get the cash and discount. Oh, yeah, no, Present no. Value. I'm not saying value in use. So you are saying value in use. You are saying value in use. My question is, how do I determine the fair value less estimated cost to sell? 
Market Which value is... minus cost of disposal. Yeah, wait, okay. wait, 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 wait. Which figure is relevant here? 78 or 150? 78. 78. Why not 150? Why not 150? Because 150 is that of a new machine. Well, this our machine has already been used. All right. I love that. I love that. So we do 78 minus 2,500. I love that. Thank you so much. I'm impressed. So 78. Eight minus two thousand five hundred. Because one fifty is for. Yes, correct. Seventy eight minus. Mm -hmm. So I need value in use. Value in use. Value in use is the present value of the estimated cash flow. Okay, they've given me net cash flow. For the next three years, eight percent applies. Okay, look at what I will do. I will say uh, J one two three. Net cash flow. Net cash flow. Thirty. This year at six percent. So I will do one point zero six. Is it at six percent or eight percent? Is it raised to the power of minus one? So let me change this one to eight percent. Thank you. So eight percent. Copy and paste. Year two, root by minus two. Year three, minus three. So I will say this guy here multiply by this guy. I will drag down. I will sum up. This is my value in use. This is my fair value less cost to sell. I told you that my recovery value is higher. So therefore, therefore, recoverable value is color seven seven three one two or 313 approximately. So impairment loss, impairment loss. The carrying value, how much is the carrying value? Carrying value is 85, which is more than recoverable value, recoverable value. So this man minus this man. So what is my impairment loss? Seven six eight five. Let's go back to the question. What's the answer? A for Argentina. Any question? Can you go back to the one thing? Okay. And here. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Said. Yes. Assuming there is no cost of disposal, we'll just use uh, the seventy-eight, right? Seventy-eight yeah. thousand. Okay. Any other question? So we fine. Yeah, we're fine. Okay. So number six. Oh yeah, number six. Who is reading? 
Serpes in number five. Please, in question five, what's the purpose of competition? So, what? Hello, can you come again? In question five, what was the purpose yeah. of competing with one five five hundred? Yeah. What purpose or what? Purpose or what? Competing is five five hundred. Look at. If I'm carrying out an assessment for impairment, I need three figures. Number one, carrying value. Number two, fair value less cost to sell. And number three, value in use. So. For me to say this figure is my recoverable value, I will pick whichever figure that is higher between fair value less cost to sale and value in use. My fair value less cost to sale is 75,500. My value in use is 77,313. Which one is higher? Is 77,313. Automatically, I will drop 75,500. That is no longer useful for me. Are you fine? Yes, that's fair. Thank you. So let's go back. Number six, six. IS payment of assets suggest how indication how indications of impairment might be recognized. Which two of the following would be external indicators that one or more of an asset of an entity's assets may be impaired? A an unusually significant fall in the market value of one or more assets. Two students of one or more assets. D, a decline in the economic performance of one or more assets. D, and get interest rates used to calculate value in use in one. A, D. A and 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 D. Wait to A and D. Are you sure? Somebody said B and C. Yeah, and D. Yeah, Do you have any questions? Are you fine? Yes, we are fine, sir. Yeah, evidence of obsolescence. Yeah. Oh, okay. Obsolescence is internal, not external. So let say one. Relates to an item of plans. Is carrying value, is carrying amount in the statement of financial position is three million dollars. The company has received an offer of seven million from a company in Japan interested in buying the plans. The present value of the estimated cash flows from continued use of the assets is two point six million. The estimated cost of shipping the plant to Japan is $50 million. What is the amount of the impairment loans that should be recognized on the plant? OK, so let's answer this question together. What's the current value of this asset? Three million. Very good. Giving three million. What is the fair value less estimated cost to sell? 2.650. Eh? Yeah. 2.650. 2.7 minus 50,000. Yeah, it's 2.7 minus 50,000. 2.650. Very good. 2.650. I love that. What is the in value in use? 2.6. So, what figure will now represent the recoverable value? 2.65. Because it's the higher figure. So, how much is the impairment? It's 3 minus 2. 3 million minus 2.65. Fantastic. Any question? Are we fine? Can we move to the next topic? Yes, please. Fire on, Mr. Sai. Okay. Let me so let me see the answer for number seven. Okay, three minus two point six five zero. So let me, let me just quickly rush through it. Mm. That question. That's three fifty. The current value is three million. Is giving. Yeah. One two three. One two three. 
so the recoverable value recoverable value is the higher of the fair value less cost to sell and value in use so fair value less cost to sell in this question what do i do i will say 2.7 million minus yes. 50,000. 50, so, which is 2700000 minus 50,000. And value in use, value in use in this question is 2C00000. So automatically, that means my recoverable value, recoverable value, recoverable value is the higher, is impairment loss. Impairment loss is the difference between the 3 million minus 2.650, which is 350, and that's all. Okay. Can I go to the next one? Yes, sir. Um, investment property. Investment property. That's the next topic I want to treat, investment property. Okay, let me ask you a question. I'm asking the class this question. If I have a, a if I have um, furniture, I have furniture with an intention to rent it out to people and collect rental income. That, that's the purpose of those furniture. The intention is to rent it out to people and college rent income. In my financial statement, what would be the classification of that furniture? Inventory. I'm not selling it. Not selling it. Investment property. Investment property. Investment property. Okay. When is the exam? When is the exam? 10th of June. And today is 16th of May. Okay. So let me not tell you something. <laughs> it's not investment property. Please. It's not investment property. Please just listen to me. In accounting today, when I call an asset an investment property, the asset must be a land or a building, or both land and building. Please take note. Any other aspects that I'm holding for renter that is not a land, is not a building, and is no land and building, cannot be investment property. Please take note. Are you fine? Who's going to do that? Hello? I said, please come again with that. Okay, let me come again. <clears throat> there is a golden principle that says, investment property is a land or a building or both land and building that is held for capital appreciation or to earn rental income. So what does that mean from that definition? It means investment property cannot be a furniture. That's the meaning. It means investment property cannot be a motor vehicle. It means investment property cannot be a generator. That is the meaning. Because the standards streamline the category of assets that can be investment property. And what are the category of the asset that can be investment property? Is either a land, or a building, or both land and building. Please take notes. 
Are you fine? Hello? Yes, yes. Yes, yes thank you. Okay. That means any other category yeah, of assets other than land or building that is air to end capital appreciation or to end rental income cannot be an investment property. That is the meaning. That is the meaning. Okay. So for an investment property, what are the recognition criteria? The standard says recognize an investment property when two criteria. Have sorry, right. Said. Yes. Hello, Said. I can hear you. What can, I, what can we call it now? If it's a furniture, furniture or is it PP? What can we call it? PP. Just PP. Yeah. Okay. You... Thank you. Yes, yes. So, an investment property should be recognized <clears throat> if and only if the following criteria are met. Number one, if it is probable that future economic benefit will flow to the entity as a result of the use of the asset. Or number two, if the cost of the asset can be reliably measured. Can you please share your screen? Okay, let me share my screen. No problem. You will see shortly. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. Recognition criteria. There are two different criteria for an investment property. Number one says it might be probable that future economic benefit will flow to the entity. And number two says the cost of the asset must be reliably measured. The cost of the asset must be reliably measured. So are you fine? Okay. Um, before I go to measurement of an investment property, if I go to measurement, let me talk about, about three things. Okay. Okay. First one I want to talk about is property interest, property interest. Please, I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. Property interest, what am I referring to? This standard is saying that if I lease a property from someone and based on the agreement I'm having with the owner of that property, I can also bring a third party to be residing in that property and I'll be collecting rental income from the new tenant. That means in this case, there are three parties. Number one, the owner of the asset who happens to be the lessor Number two, myself, I am the lessee in this case. And number three, the sub lessee. So what this one is saying is, if that lease is, a, is in the form of an operating lease, ideally, I should not recognize an asset in my financial statement, ideally, because it's an operating lease. However, I can recognize an investment property only if I'm ready to use fair value model to measure the interest in that property. And what does that mean? How do I determine the fair value? That means I need to estimate the rent I will collect from the tenant, who happens to be the sub lessee, and discount to present value. So the present value in my financial statement will become the investment property. I will need to be doing that every year. I will compare the fair value this year with the fair value last year. Difference in fair value, either an increase or a decrease will be recognized in profit or loss. Are you fine? Hello, Mr. Said. Yes. What you just what you just explained now, I believe I believe is from the perspective of the lessee, right? Yeah, from the lessee. Oh. Are you fine? Hello? Are we all fine? Can I move? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes sir. Okay. Auxiliary services. Auxiliary services. Please listen to me. I, I want you to pay attention. Okay. I've seen an instance before now whereby I can rent an apartment, maybe somewhere in Lagos, Lagos, Nigeria, and the tenant will be providing 
food, security, cleaning, utility, and maintenance service. This standard is saying that so I be very careful. If you rent an apartment or you are paying for occupying a space, and whoever owns that particular space provides food, provides cleaning, provides security, provides utility, provides maintenance services. All these things I've mentioned, we call them auxiliary services. What this thing is saying is sometimes that particular apartment may not be an investment property. How? If I have a building, let me say that building is having 10 flats. I'm the owner of the building. All those people that reside in those flats, I provide, I provide electricity for them. When there is no light, when there's no public electricity, I will be the one in charge. I will put on my generating plant and power their apartment. At the same time, I provide food for them. I have a central kitchen that I provide food for them. At the same time, I provide their cleaning. I provide laundry for them. I provide utility. I provide maintenance and services for them. This standard is saying that my property may not be an investment property. I need to carry out an assessment. And what assessment am I carrying out? This principle is saying that if the quantum of the auxiliary service I provide to the residents is considered to be material and significant, automatically, that my apartment, that building is no longer an investment property. That building, my financial statement, should be recognized as a PPE. A good example is hotel business. However, if the quantum of the auxiliary service I provide to the resident are considered to be insignificant, that means that property, my financial statement, can be considered to be an investment property. Are you fine? Are you fine? from whose perspective? Eh, no, from the from the perspective of the owner, not from the perspective of the resident. Okay. If from the perspective okay. of the owner, yes. Are you fine? Okay, I move on now. I move on. Investment property in consolidated financial statement. And what this one trying to say? It's possible that a parent company has a building and the subsidiary occupies that building and the subsidiary pays rent to the parent. Or it can also be vice versa. In the books for the parent company, it is an investment property, but on consolidation, it becomes a PPE. Please take notes. Can I proceed? Yes, please. Hello. Okay. Asset with dual purpose. Asset with dual purpose. What does it mean? I have a building. I'm holding partly to earn rental income and partly for owners occupied. What do I need to do? The standard requires that as you account for each of the components separately when separation is possible. The question is, at what point will separation become possible? Separation becomes possible if the portion that is being aired for renter can be sold in a separate transaction without affecting the entire building. It means separation is possible. And in that case, I need to account for each of the components separately. The portion that is being aired to end rental income becomes an investment property, and the other portion becomes a property plant and equipment. That means even though it's a single building, two accounting standards apply to each of the components of the building. However, whenever separation is not possible, what do I need to do? As the owner of the building, I need to use judgment. In using judgment, I need to consider a fact. And what is that fact? The entire property becomes an investment property if the portion that is being earned for non-investment is considered to be insignificant. Let me come again. The entire property becomes an investment property if the portion that is being earned for non-investment is considered to be insignificant. 
However, the entire property becomes a PPE as well. If the portion that is being earned for investment purpose is considered to be insignificant. I believe we are fine. Okay, so let's look at some question here. Um, before I move to question, I need to make I want to mention one or two things. Initial measurement for investment property should be cost. Cost taken into consideration transaction cost. Please notice somewhere. Initial measurement for investment property should be cost, and the cost should be taken into consideration transaction cost. Subsequent measurement can be cost, which means I will depreciate. And it can also be fair value, which means I will not depreciate. If I use cost model subsequently, that means I will depreciate it over the estimated useful life. For the purpose of depreciation, land should be separated from building, even though they are acquired together. And depreciation should be recognized in profit or loss as an expense. The current value becomes the cost minus the accumulated depreciation. On that fair value model, I don't depreciate the asset. I determine the fair value. Difference in fair value, whether an increase or a decrease, is recognized in profit or loss. And the standard requires that once you've adopted fair value model, you should apply fair value for the entire class of the property. Not saying, oh, I have five investment property, three are in Lagos, the remaining two are outside Lagos. But those three that are in Lagos, the market value has increased drastically and automatically. I will only fair value those one in Lagos and I will abandon those one not in Lagos. The standard does not permit that. You don't do selective fair value measurement. When you, when you want to use fair value model, you must use fair value for the entire class. So let's go to question now. Question number one. Somebody should read. So who is reading? Hello? Which one of the following will be recognized as an investment property under IS 40 in the Consolidated Financial Statements of Build Co? A, a property intended for sale in the ordinary course of business. B, a property being constructed for a customer. C, a property held by Build Co under the finance lease and lease out under an operating lease. D, a property owned by Build Co and lease out to a subsidiary. So what's the answer? C. D. D. C. What's the answer? D. C. D. C. Wait, wait, okay, wait, wait, wait. Nobody said A. I love that. That means you know that A cannot be an investment property. A must be inventory. But I think I add B. Somebody said B, yes or no? Don't be afraid to no. talk to me. Yes. Yeah. Wait, who said B? Just talk Nobody. to me. Some... Eh? I said I said B. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. Nice one. But the answer cannot be B. Let yeah, me ask. I know. When you construct a property for a customer, what standard applies? Revenue recognition. Revenue. Yeah. That means in my books, I'm the one that construct the property. It's not my building. It's not my property. I cannot recognize it in my financial statement. What I will only recognize is the amount I will collect from the customer or from my client. As what? As revenue. That means B cannot be an answer as well. I don't know whether somebody says C. I don't know who says C. I said C. I said C. I said C. Okay. Who said B? I said who said D? Who said D? Denmark. Who said D? I said D. Okay. I said D. Okay, you said D. Okay, before I go to C, let me talk about C. Ah, D. D cannot be an answer here. Do you know why? Do you know why? Consolidated. Fantastic. Consolidated. Yeah. Oh, subsidiary. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. So if it was not a subsidiary. No, no worry. It's, it's hunger. <laughs> I believe. No, honestly. Yeah, very good. So the major reason, we are listening to me or listen to me. Listen to me. The reason why this 
this answer, this question here, this is not an answer. It's not only because it's subsidiary. It can be subsidiary and D can also be an answer. The major reason why it is not an answer in this case is because of consolidated financial statements. But assuming I'm looking at it from the perspective of the, the owner, if I'm looking at it from the financial statement of the owner of this building, if it is not consolidated, it is an investment property. And that's what the standard is saying. If, if ACCA is a parent company, and the subsidiary is financial reporting. ACCA has a property somewhere in London, and financial reporting, the subsidiary occupies that property and pays ACCA rent every year. In the books of ACCA, that property is an investment property, but on consolidation, the property automatically becomes a PPE. So please, don't get it wrong. The major reason why D is not an answer here is not only because it is a subsidiary. The ultimate reason is because this question said in the consolidated financial statement. So the answer to this question is what? C. C for Canada. Are we fine? Yeah. So question number two. Which I'm one of sorry, the following? Sorry, I have a question. Okay, what's the question? Yeah, that explanation you just gave. Um, I just want to clarify something. Does it mean that um, the, I was assuming that arms length, um, the arms length and assumption also comes into consideration here? That because the cover it's it's in group, then the arms length criteria is no longer um, so no, that will make it no, not qualify no, for. No, automatic. Jamie must have taken you through consolidation. Sometimes. A parent company will say to subsidiary at a profit for consolidation purpose, you take away the unrealized profits. So it's not automatic. It's not automatic that when I say to my subsidiary, I must make a loss. No. Or when I say to my subsidiary, I must say at, at a cost or, or it must be free of charge. No, it's not automatic. It's not automatic unless you are told. Don't assume unless you are told. Please don't assume for the examiner. So are you fine? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, question number two. Which one of the following is not true concerning the treatment of investment properties under IES 14? Mm -hmm. A. Following initial recognition, investment property can be held at either cost or fair value. Is it correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Go to yes, correct. Yes, yeah. correct. It's correct. Following it's correct. initial recognition, I told you that initially the must be cost. Uh -uh. I'm, what I'm asking is, is that statement correct? Forget about the question. Is the statement correct? Yeah, the statement is correct. So let's go to B now. B, if an investment property is held at fair value, this must be applied to all of the entity's investment property. Is that statement correct? Yes. Yes. Very yes. Correct. Yes. 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 A cannot be an answer. B cannot be an answer. That is the meaning. C now. An investment property is initially measured at cost, including transaction cost. Is it correct? Yes. 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 Correct. Just yes. told you. Correct. We are D. Let's look at D. D. A gain or loss arising from the change in fair value of an investment property should be recognized in other comprehensive income. Is it correct? No. No, no POL. Where should it be recognized? No. POL. Fantastic. POL. Very good. Question number, time. question number three is not for this topic. I'm so sorry. So can I move to the next topic? Yes, yes sir. Yes, please. Uh, Okay, next topic is IS2, inventory. Inventory. So let me open the slide for inventory. Inventories are assets that are 
Number one, aid for sale in the ordinary course of business. Number two, in the process of production for such sale. And number three, in form of materials or supply to be consumed in the production process or in the course of rendering services. So that means, based on this definition, inventories can be number one, raw material, number two, work in progress, number three, finished goods, and number four, consumables. That is the meaning. How do I measure my inventory? Inventory must be measured at the lower of cost and their next realizable value. Inventory must be measured at the lower of cost and their net realizable value. What is the objective? The objective is that in no circumstances should I overvalue my inventory. In no circumstances should I put an amount to an inventory that is more than what I can recover from that inventory. This principle looks similar to the principle of impairment, but we don't call it impairment. Please take note. This principle looks similar to the principle of impairment, but we don't call it impairment. So which standard applies? IS2. Take note. Okay. Based on the measurement of inventory, there are two components of the measurement. Number one, we have the cost. And number two, we have the net realizable value. Let me come again. The measurement of inventory has two components. Number one component is the cost, and number two component is the net realizable value. So let me pick the cost. Cost of inventory can be broken down into two. Number one, I can have cost of inventory that are manufactured by an entity. For example, for example, let me assume I'm um, 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 Toyota Manufacturing Company. I manufacture Toyota cars. In my financial statement, those cars to me are inventories. That means the cost of those cars will be the cost I've incurred to manufacture those cars. That is the meaning. At the same time, if I'm also a car dealer, I buy cars from Toyota and I sell in my ordinary course of business. Remember, I'm not the manufacturer of that cars I'm buying. In my financial statement as well, those cars are also inventory. The cost to me will not be the same cost to, to, to Toyota. So the cost of inventory can be divided into two, looking at it from two different perspectives. Perspective number one, if I'm the manufacturer of the inventory, and perspective number two, if I buy the inventory with an intention to resell. I don't know whether you're fine. Are you fine with that? Yes, sir. OK, so let me now break it down. If I'm if 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 I'm the manufacturer of inventory, what are the likely cost of inventory? If I'm the manufacturer, have we had the cost of raw material, the cost of direct labor, the cost of direct expenses, and any other directly attributable costs, which you call cost of conversion. But if I'm not the manufacturer, if I buy outside with an intention to resell. The cost to me include purchase price, associated taxes, cost of transportation, cost of import duties, handling costs, and I need to subtract trade discount and rebate from it. In IS2, the standard says there are some costs or expenses that should not be taken into consideration for the purpose of determining cost of inventory. Please give me one second, please. One second. Okay, I'm back. So in IS2, 
what the standard is saying, there are some costs that should not be taken into consideration for the purpose of determining cost of inventory. They should not be taken into consideration. So what are these costs? These costs include, number one, any cost on abnormal wastages. Number two, any cost of storage, except when storage is necessary. Number three, any cost that has to do with administrative expenses. And number four, any cost that relate to selling. All those four costs should not be taken into consideration for the purpose of determining the total cost of inventory. Are you fine? Hello, are we there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Cost formula. Cost formula. For the purpose of cost formula, inventory can be categorized into two. We have inventory that are not interchangeable, and we have inventory that are interchangeable. When inventories are not interchangeable, the standard requires that the formula I need to use is the formula we call specific identification method. But when inventories are interchangeable, what formula can I use? I can use FIFO, I can use weighted average, but LIFO is not permitted by IS2. Next realizable value, what does it mean? It means the expected selling price minus the estimated selling cost. That is the meaning. Expected selling price minus the estimated selling cost. Ideally, ideally, the next realizable value of inventory should be more than the cost of inventory. Ideally, in a perfect situation, the next realizable value of inventory should be more than the cost of inventory. However, under certain circumstances, the cost of inventory can be higher. What are these circumstances? Number one, when there is an increase in cost without a corresponding increase in selling price, or when there is a reduction in selling price without a corresponding reduction in cost. Number two, when inventory has been physically deteriorated or physically damaged. Number three, when inventory becomes obsolete. And number four, when it's a part of marketing strategy to manufacture and sell product at a loss. And number five, when it has to do with error in production or error in purchasing. Can I proceed? Okay, that means I can proceed. So, inventory should be recognized as an expense. Remember, inventory is an asset, and ideally, it should be sitting in my current assets part of my balance sheet. However, inventory can become an expense when, number one, there is a write down to naturalizable value. And number two, there is a consumption of those inventory. Or number three, that inventory has been disposed. In those three circumstances, inventory becomes an expense in profit or loss. So let's look at question. Somebody should read question number one. Isaac is a company which buys agricultural produce from host suppliers for retail to the general public. It is preparing its financial statements for the year ending 30th September to 20th Expo and is considering its closing inventory. In, in addition to IS2 inventories, which of the following IFRSs may be relevant to determining the figure to be included in its financial? statements for closing inventories. A, IS-10, events after the reporting period. B, IS-30, intangible assets. C, IS-16, 
property, plant, and equipment. D, I get 41, agriculture. What's the answer? A. D. A. 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 Why not D? Why not D? Because it's not producing agri agricultural products. Oh. I think. Very good. The answer is not D, because this company is not the one that has to do it. Harvesting. This company will buy and sell. If I buy the cultural produce and sell, IS 41 may not apply. So the answer is A, correct. Question two. So much for the question two. Caminas has Camina. the following. Caminas has the following products in inventory at the year end. Product quantity, cost, selling. Okay. Product quantity, cost, selling price. At what amount should total inventory be in the statement of financial position? Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, I was saying something because I need. Question one, there is only one date there, so how do we know is event after the reporting period? Ah, that means you must have read. You need to read before you will know that. I extend. We definitely affect the current value of my closing inventory. But you told me that Jamie has done it today. Have you not done it today? Yes, he has. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I can't see it in this person. Said, it is preparing the financial report for the year ending status. So they did not tell us if he's done. I understand yeah. that, that it covers the period when he's done preparing the financial statement and when it's about to issue. Oh, no. so, wait, wait, wait. Before I can start to prepare, the financial year must have ended. Do you agree with me? Before I can start yes. to prepare, the financial year must have ended. I extend defines events after reporting period as those events that occur after the financial year, but before the financial statement will be authorized for issue. And that is it. So I extend applies basically. If before I can start to prepare my financial statement, the year must have ended. Automatically, I extend can affect the current value of my inventory. Remember, Jamie must have taught you I extend today. Jamie must have told you those events can be adjusting, it can be non-adjusting events. And a good example of adjusting events is if after the financial year end, you discover that the net realizable value of your inventory has reduced, I extend required that you need to go back and adjust the current value of your inventory to the new net realizable value. That's it. Okay. Have products. Product A, product B, product C. For product A. It's fine, you can go ahead. Yeah. My NRV for product A. NRV for product A is 55 minus 8. Cost for product B is my NRV for product B is 25 minus 4. Cost for product C is 23. And the NRV is 27 minus 5. What's the quantity? The quantity for this guy is 1,000. Quantity for this guy is 2,500. 
quantity for this guy is 800. Remember, I told you inventory must be measured at the lower. Which one is lower? Cost is lower here. Is lower here. Cost. 22 is lower here. So what will be the amount? I will say 1,000 multiplied by 40. Something applies to this guy. And this guy, I will say 800 multiplied by 22. What is my total value? Ninety five one hundred. That is option C. Are you fine? Next question. In which of the following situations is the net realizable value? Of an item of inventory likely to be lower than cost. A. The production cost of the item has, has been falling. B. The selling price of the item has been rising. C. The item is becoming obsolete. D. Demand for the item is increasing. What's the answer? C. C. Correct. Number four is another topic entirely. We treat it when we get to that topic. Any question before I proceed? Any question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's go to IS 23. Borrowing cost. Borrowing costs are interest and other costs incurred by an entity in connection with borrowing of funds. So the following are examples of borrowing costs. Interest on bank overdraft, short-term and long-term borrowings. Amortization of auxiliary costs incurred in connection with arrangement of borrowing. Finance charges in respect of finance lease recognized in accordance with IFRS 16. Exchange differences arising from foreign currency borrowings to the extent that they are regarded as adjustments to the interest cost. All these are examples of borrowing costs. The principle in IS 23 is whenever you incur borrowing costs, Capitalize borrowing costs on qualifying assets and expense borrowing costs on assets that are not qualifying assets. So the question is, what are qualifying assets? And the, the answer is, qualifying assets are assets that necessarily take a substantial period of time before the assets are ready for intended use or for sale. Let me come again. Qualifying assets are assets that will take a substantial period of time before the asset will be ready for intended use or for sale. So depending on the circumstances, qualifying assets can be inventory, qualifying assets can be manufacturing plants, qualifying assets can be power generating facility, intangible asset, investment property. The principle in IS 23 is, Whenever borrowings, whenever borrowings is from various sources, before I can determine my borrowing cost, what I need to do is to determine what we call capitalization rate. And what is capitalization rate? It means the weighted average cost of capital. That is the meaning. The weighted average cost of capital. Remember, Borrowing costs can be determined in two different ways. 
depending on the question. Number one, when borrowing is from one source, my borrowing cost is a principal multiplied by the interest provided. However, if I'm having different sources of borrowing, automatically I will have different principal amounts. I will have different interest rates. What the standard is saying is, what I need to do first is to determine what we call capitalization rates. I need to determine the weighted average cost of borrowing. After doing that, my borrowing cost will now be the, that rate I've computed multiplied by the actual expenditure that I've been incurred. That will give me my borrowing cost. And another principle says, whenever I borrow for a particular task or for a particular project, and part of the proceed from that borrowing has been invested temporarily, and I'm having investment income. The borrowing cost that is eligible for capitalization must be less investment income. Please take note. The borrowing cost eligible for capitalization must be less investment income. Another thing I need to talk about now before I start solving question is at what point do I commence capitalization or borrowing costs? I will commence capitalization when three criteria are met simultaneously. Number one criteria says when expenditure on the asset has been incurred. Number two criteria says when borrowing costs has been incurred. And number three criteria says when activity necessary to make the assets ready for intended use or for sale as commands. At what point will I suspend capitalization? I will suspend capitalization when active development is interrupted for an extended period of time. For those period, I will still continue to compute borrowing costs but in that case, the borrowing cost will not be capitalized to the asset. The borrowing cost will be recognized in profit or loss as part of my finance cost. That is the principle. And at what point will I cease capitalization? I will cease capitalization when substantially construction of the asset has been completed. Any question? Hello. Yeah, yes, sir. I have a question. What's the question? Okay. Um, you just give a clarification now uh, about about um how that when activity is stopped, we can stop the capitalization of borrowing cost and instead expense it. That is well understood. But how does the stoppage of production activities impact the investment, the return on investment. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you come again? Okay, you know that based on what you explained, there are two ends to borrowing cost. The part of the borrowed funds that we are committing into the project and the yes. part that we are temporarily investing, maybe because we don't need it immediately so i'm saying when when production activities are stopped we stop capitalizing the um, interest on the borrowed funds and rather we expense it for that period so i'm saying this is well understood however how does this impact the um the return for that portion that we have invested for the period of non-activity what happens in terms of what in terms of what in terms of how we calculate, you know, usually we will net off as we are calculating the cost on the borrowed funds. We are still looking at what we are um, the returns from the portion of it that we have invested. So I just want to know how, how. Okay, this is what I observe. I saw a question. Well, let me just tell you why I'm asking this question so that you can understand better what I'm driving at. So I was having a question. Or I was looking through a solution to a question, and I realized that the examiner actually also stopped the accruing of returns on the portion that was invested. And I was like, look, we only stopped activities 
um, regarding the production we are committing the borrowed funds into. The portion we have invested um, in a completely different um, 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 whatever did not stop. So why are we also suspending the computation of return on that invested portion? You know, that was a confusion I had. So I, I just want you to throw some insights into how we manage that period of non-activity with respect to the portion of the borrowed funds that has been reinvested somewhere else. I don't know if you understand what I'm driving at. I your question. It makes sense to me. Okay, there is a principle in accounting, and that principle has to do with what we call matching principle. And what is matching principle saying? It's saying orange for orange, banana for banana. And what does that mean? If if I'm saying I borrow an amount from a bank for a particular project, and I've commenced the construction of that project. But as a result of one or two reasons, I need to suspend the construction for a period. And part of the proceed I got from the loan, I've also invested it temporarily. Remember that the bank will charge me interest for the entire tenure of the borrowing, irrespective of whether I've suspended construction. Do you agree with me? At the same time, what I've used that proceed for for temporary investment, I will also continue to, 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 to end the investment return on it, irrespective whether I have suspended construction. So what the principle is saying is, for you not to recognize an asset that doesn't exist, that interest that you need to pay the bank for the period when construction has been suspended, those interests, you don't need to capitalize it as well you also need to recognize it in profit or loss. For matching principle, that particular return for that same period, she also go to profit or loss. And that's it. Matching principle, that interest for that period, she also go to profit or loss. That means what relate to the asset will be for the period their active development or active construction are being carried out, both for the cost and also for the investment income. I don't know whether that makes sense to you now. Hello? Hello? It does. It, does. it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay. So somebody should read this question. Apex. So who is ready? Are we tired? Apex is a publicly listed supermarket chain. During the current year, it started the building of a new store. The directors are aware that in accordance with IS23 borrowing costs, certain borrowing costs have to be capitalized. Details relating to construction of Apex new store. Apex issued a 10 million unsecured loan with a coupon nominal interest rate of 6% on 1st April 20x8. The loan is redeemable at a premium, which means the loan has an effective finance cost of 7.5% per annum. The loan was specifically issued to finance the building of the new store, which means the definition of a qualify which meets the definition of a qualifying asset in IAS 23. Construction of the store commenced on 1st May 20x8, and it was completed and ready for use on 28 February 20x8, but did not open, open for trading until 1st of April 20x9. Um, question one, Apex new store meets the definition of a qualifying asset. Which of the following describes a qualifying asset? A, an asset that is ready for use or sale when purchased. B, an asset that takes over 12 months to get ready for use or sale. C, an asset that is intended for use rather than sale. D, an asset that takes a substantial period of time to get ready for use or sale. What's the answer? D, D. D. an asset that takes a substantial period. 
D. Very good. The answer is D. Option D. The next question. So the next question. Apex issued the loan stock on 1st April 20x8. Three events or transactions must be taking place for capitalization of borrowing costs to commence. Which one of the following is not one of these? A. Expenditure on the asset is being incurred. B. Borrowing costs are being incurred. C. Fiscal construction of the asset is nearing completion. D. Necessary activities are in process to prepare the asset for use or sale. What's the answer? C. C. Number three. What is the total of the finance cost which can be capitalized in respect of Apex's new store? Okay, thank you very much. Let me go back to the question. How much was borrowed? $10 million. Abby? Yep. Who can tell yes, me? 10 million. At what date will I start to capitalize based on this question? At what date will I start to capitalize? May. May, first May. Eh? First of first May. First of May. I disagree with you. I disagree with you. Why? Oh, yeah, wait, 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 wait. When I showed you. It's when the funds were secure now. When I showed you commencement of capitalization, there, there was nothing like physical construction. I told you when expenditure on the asset has been incurred, when borrowing cost has been incurred, and when activity necessary has commenced. So let me now go back to the question. So the loan was taken when? April 1. Any other information about loan was specified? Blah, 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 So based on this question, no other information contradicts the fact that I will start to capitalize April 1. Are you fine? Hello, are you fine? No. Why no? Why no? So can you go over it again? My understanding was that we will not capitalize until we have the comments, right? Uh, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Why do you tell me that C is not an answer here? Why do you tell me C is an answer here? Why? Because of its nearing completion. Ah, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Wait, I now see. It means that you only guess and you guess right here because there was nearing completion in part of this option. Ah, no, that's not it. So there is nothing in the standard that says a criteria has to do with construction. Nothing. Please take note. Of, please listen to me attentively. The only reason why you may need to take the date of construction as a date we start to capitalize borrowing costs is whenever no other information is provided. Whenever no other information is provided, and the only date you are having is the date of physical construction, you can go ahead to pick the date of physical construction as the date of commencement of capitalization. However, when the examiner provides you another date that has to do with when borrowing costs was incurred, or when activity that are necessary has commenced, or when the expenditure has been incurred, please neglect the dates that has to do with physical construction. Please take note. Of, I'm begging you, please take note. Look at the criteria I showed you. Please, somebody should read the criteria again and tell me whether in this criteria you have physical construction in the criteria. Please, somebody should read all over again. Hello. Expenditure on the Expenditure on the asset is being incurred. Mm -hmm. Borrowing costs are being incurred. Mm -hmm. Activities are in progress that are necessary to prepare the asset for its intended use or sale. So, do you see anything that has to do with physical construction here? Eh, not really, sir. But I was taking it from the angle of expenditure on the assets is being incurred because 
nothing says on the, on first of April we have started um, any expenditure. But I mean, from the first of May, we are sure that expenditure is going on already. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Physical construction and expenditure are not the same thing, though. Look at the question. Look at the question. Ah, I can I can incur an expenditure, and yet I know physical construction. Coming. Look at they say the construction of the store commence. Construction. Oh, yeah, wait. If I want to construct a building, it's possible for me to have bought a land. It's possible for me to have bought cement, bought blocks, bought granite, and yet I've not started construction. We need to be very careful. They, they said it here construction, construction, construction. Are you fine? Are you fine? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's good. OK. So at what date will I stop to capitalize? Eh? Will you stop? Yes. Stop. Stop. 28th of February. Yes, February. Okay. How much is the loan? How much is the loan? Ten million dollars. Okay, I'm coming. Up. Okay. Which can be capitalized. Okay. So loan amount, loan amount is ten million. IR, IR is six percent. IR, IR. Is seven point five per cent. The tenor, the duration. Hey, you can't see my screen. Yeah. Okay. Your screen is blank. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. Can you see it now? Yes, exactly. Yes, sir. Yes. Duration of duration of the loan. Duration of the project. April. And April. 20x8 to to 28 February 20x9 to 28 February 20x9 who can tell me how many months we have in between? 11. 11 months. 
with the borrowing cost. Borrowing cost. It can be capitalized. It's 10, 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, pay by 7.5 divided by 100 by 11 Okay. Hello, are we there? Hello. Yes, sir. We're here. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. What I did initially, because based on what the standard says, based on what the standard says, physical construction of the asset is not a criteria for commencement of capitalization. So if, if I'm the one who, ideally, I'm not in support of what they've done here. I'm not in support of what they've done here. What they've done here is to use the date of construction as a criteria. I'm not in support, but I think that's what they've done here. What I did initially was to use April as a commencement date, and I assume the date of cessation will be the 28th of February. But after doing that, what I got is not part of the option. And I went back to change it, and I and I assume from a, from May. So if I count from May to, to February, May to February should give me ten months. Please, somebody should confirm. Is it yeah. ten months? It's ten, ten months. months. Ten months. Yes. So duration of the project here. So I will change it for the sake of this particular question for me to align with what they've done i will change it to to, to first of may but i'm not in support of this solution i'm not in support of this solution to me this solution is not absolutely correct because there is no way in the standard that says construction should be part of the criteria to commence capitalization excuse me sir okay so which one should we follow your own or their own <laughs> I think we return. Yeah, and if you go to the question, yeah. they mentioned that construction yeah. commenced, right? Uh -huh. So I yeah. think because of the commenced word that was used, you know, it's not really about the construction, but the fact that they said it was it commenced, activities commenced first okay. May 2018. Okay. Hmm. okay. I think we should be thankful that the other option, the other answer is not in the option. I think it would make it easy for us. So May I know what we're not going to choose? The first April 20x9. When they said they're ready. Eh? I said, May I know why we're not considering the fact that but did not open for trading on the first April 20x9? Because I, because I told you that I will stop to capitalize when substantially construction has been completed so the information that has to do with trading is none of my business are you fine with that yes thank you okay mr saeed can i ask yes. a question please yeah ask, ask please. um relating to retracement to the first of april and first of may yeah. i don't know if this has to do with um something like research and development because i know that when you start a project 
when uh -huh. you are carrying out research on it or whenever you say that you start a project, they don't start capitalizing until the date that um, development is started. So I think in this scenario, they are taking the date of the construction to be the actual development of the project because that's the day they actually started working on the project. First of April is just the day they collected the they allocated the money for the project. They've not started the project. I think that's why they went for 1st of May. So I think the solution is actually in order. <laughs> okay, I've heard you. Thank you very much. Just, but I'm not, I'm not representing this. I'm not in support for the solution. There's no problem, I've heard you. Sorry, please, can you go to this? Uh, can you touch us, uh, Chris, on this answer? Okay, I'm see the form now. I said 10 million times 7.5 percent times 10 divided by 12. Are you fine? Thanks. Okay. Okay, no problem. Let's continue. Okay, let's look at this number four. Someone's read number four. Rather than take out, rather than take out a loan specifically for the new store, Apex could have funded the store from existing borrowings, which are ten percent bank loan at fifty million and eight percent bank loan at thirty million. In this case, it will be it will have applied the capitalization rate to the expenditure on the asset. What would that rate have been? Okay, so let me let me try and copy this guy. Let me try and copy this guy. Let me take it to my exam. Okay. Capitalization rate is a weighted average. Capitalization weighted average. So what do I do? The ten percent loan for the ten percent bank loan. What I will do? I will say ten percent multiplied by. 50 divided by 80. For the 8% loan, 8% bank loan, I will say I will say eight percent multiply by thirty divided by eighty. Multiply by thirty divided by eighty. So what's the answer? C. Eh? C. D. 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 Okay, wait. You started the class since what time? Nine. Nine o'clock in the morning. Don't worry, your, 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 reward, your reward is coming very soon. Very, very soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number five. Maybe after number five, let me go to another topic. I'm having, I'm having less than 15 minutes left. So let me go to another topic. 
Somebody should read. Number five. Okay. If up Apex had been able to temporarily invest the proceeds of the loan from 1st April to 1st May, when construction began, how will the proceeds be accounted for? A, deducted from finance cost. B, deducted from the cost of asset. C, recognized as investment income in the statement of profit or loss. D, mm -hmm. deducted from admin expenses in the statement of profit or loss. What's the answer? A. C. A. A. What's the answer? A. C. 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 A. Oh yeah, wait, 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 wait. Okay. The way they've coined this question. Okay. Although A, A, I think A, A is more appropriate. Although A is more appropriate, but ultimately what I'm doing is B. Ultimately what I'm doing is B, but A is more appropriate. Are you fine? What is the loan no. expecting us to do? Okay. Actually, actually, actually. So just to clarify, what I need to do, yeah, the answer here is A, A for Argentina. That is the answer. That is the answer. Because what the standard is saying is the investment income should be used to reduce the borrowing cost. So if I use the investment income to reduce the borrowing cost, I will capitalize. So what does that mean? It means ultimately it's being subtracted from the cost of the asset. But the standard never said I should take it away from the cost of the asset. The standard says I should use it to reduce the borrowing cost that is eligible for capitalization. That means the answer to this question, based on IS 23 principle, is A, as the meaning. Uh, that's a, what's, what's the answer? Yeah, that, the answer is A, A. Wow, I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm struggling to understand why it's A. It should be B. Why B? Like you just said now. Hello, uh, Mr. Saik. Okay, 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 okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah, okay, okay, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I think the question I want to ask is for you to help us draw, if there is any, the difference between, in this context, the finance cost and the cost of the assets. Okay. Okay. Finance cost in this context is the interest element or the borrowing. The cost of the asset is the total cost of the subject matter. You know, in this question, there are two things. Number one, the borrowing, and number two, the assets. I'm using the borrowing to finance the assets. So the cost of the asset is the total cost of the asset now neglecting the financing part, which is the borrowing. So the finance cost, it is the interest on the borrowing. I don't know whether you are fine. Huh. Okay. Any other question? Any other question? Why do people talk to me? Hey, uh, talk, to me. talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. I think today is the last class. Today is the last class for the diet. But we've not done ratio, Abina. We've not done interpretation. You yeah, know, important to. Somebody told me that he has done it. He has done it. Maybe in his dream. I don't know. Let's do it too. You know what done to put that person's dream as please, well. Please submit it to stitch. Please submit to stitch. Let's do it very fast too. Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking of dropping a video on racial analysis instead of doing it in class. You can drop. Yeah, you can drop a video. Okay, that's fine. Mm. Well, the problem, this video dropping, we, um, no, um, 
this as I this is no, I'm not targeting this at you, but we've been staring at <laughs> about video dropping on some on some um on some topics yep. and um it's been we will, we will, we will. <laughs> and it yeah, is stop. not being dropped. Yeah, which topic? You know. okay. So which topic? Which topic? Uh, if I give you topic now, I'm indicting somebody with that though. <laughs> okay. But the person has promised you that you are getting it this week now. The point that promise has been coming like for the past three weeks. Oh, me you and that will, no, we, we have five minutes we left. So. This morning. We spoke this morning. Oh, and he has promised promise that he's dropping it. Don't worry. I will do the video for the ratio because the person mandated me. Jamie mandated me that I must do the video for ratio. That it will be it will be so bad for me not to do the video. So well, it's something cash like flow statements. Eh? Cash flow statements. Eh. Which year? What do you do for cash flow? Uh, Can we also get true. the video for that? Uh, we've got cash flow already in class. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, cash flow was also treated this morning at Biba Jamio. Oh. Eh? No, he said you would touch it. Even. He did not even touch it at all you, because he, he referenced you the fact it. that you have done it. Okay, no problem. Wow. What I need to do, what I, what I want somebody to do for me is can you get those days that we did cash flow? So that I can tell the management to pull out the video. Just tell me those dates. It must be accurate. Too. Just tell me those dates. I just need the dates. We did. I think we did it twice. We did the part A. We didn't finish. We did the part B, and we finalized one evening like that. Just tell yes. me the date of the cash flow. Both dates. I will. I will fish out the videos for you instead of doing the video afresh. I think something we should actually consider is someone going to the um, portal, so one of the admins, to ensure that we have videos for all the classes that that held during this period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone yeah. need to go there to check that to ensure that everything is actually done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but at the same time, for them to name it properly, to label it properly, I think it should also be nice for you to tell me the date, the date for those, uh, the the date for those topics, so that they they will be able to label it properly. Okay, so I, something important. These particular questions we are solving, can yeah. you please help us with the solutions? So we don't leave this one we are holding on to now. Hey, but the challenge is, I don't think I have a solution somewhere. But I will, I will sit down and do it and drop the solution. That means you are giving me additional work. I will sit down to do, to do it, to attempt the question, and I drop the solution for you guys. But but I, I uh, thought you uh, already uh, uh, um, capturing the solutions uh, that you are working with. Are you talking about this this exam here? Are you talking about this exam or the solution for everything? For everything. <laughs> solution to everything. Not, not you know the thing is it is going to help us. Like we may not have seen these questions. Uh, we may not we will not see it again in our revision. So it's more like. Expansion of our horizon when we solve this. Okay. I will not have. I will look for all the solution and drop them. I will look for all the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, voila. Okay. Oh, I think there is no time again. I wish you best of luck. Thank so you very much, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Sai. Can we do the number six of this question? <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Said. I've heard you. I'm going to number six. So. What, what page? Um, seven. Eight. Okay. Eight. Okay. It's eight. Okay, read the question. Capital has the following bank loans outstanding during the O of 20x8. 9% loan with repayable 20x9, 15 million. 11% loan repayable 20y2, 24 million. Capital began construction of a qualifying asset 
on 1st April 20 exit and withdrew funds of 6 million on that day to fund the construction. On 1st August 20 exit, an additional 2 million was withdrawn for the same purpose. Calculate the borrowing cost, which can be capitalized in respect of this project for the year ended 31st December 20 exit. Okay, no problem. Oh, voila. You are the boss here. I need to do to determine the capitalization rate. Ten percent loan. That will be 9 divided by 100, multiply by 15, divided by 15. 15 plus 24 is what? 1%. That is 11 divided by 100 multiplied by 24 divided by 39. So Financial year is December. Two expenditure were incurred. One was incurred in April. So expenditure incurred. Expenditure incurred. One incurred in April. I will say this guy multiply by six, one, two, three, one, two, three times. April, April December. How many months? Nine months. Nine over four. It's nine months, yeah. So give me an accurate answer. Let me see. Third point two divided by hundred. And that was in Q in August. Yeah. 10.2 divided by 100 times what? Times 2? Two, 2 million. 2 million. Five, Five months. Five months. Please, why did you use nine for April? Nine over twelve. I thought April to August is six months. No, April to December. April to December, not oh, to okay. August. Now, for some reason, the answer is not there. Ah, wait, yeah. it's your approximation error. I think maybe instead of 10.2, you can use the figure that you got there. Okay. Maybe instead of that 
that you typed out you could use the actual linking that you did before. I don't know if that made a difference. Let me try. Yeah, it's right. I'm sure the answer is A. The answer is A. It should be approximation error that is not making it to be to give us A. Yeah. So make so I'm, if you make it um ten point five, does it give us the answer? If you override the ten point two, I make it ten point five like you. If we okay, take three point five. Three point five plus seven. It's ten point five. Why is this one actually mean ten point two? Because of you know, approximation. Ah. That is true. It's ten point five. Why is it okay? That means because okay, because it's not it's approximate. Okay, I get what you are saying. So let me make it ten point five exactly. I think you should, you should give me the correct answer. Ten point five divided by hundred. You are right. Uh, you are right. You are right. I'm coming home once more. <laughs> ten point. I think she's right. I'm just wondering why this one gave me ten point two. And uh -huh. So we should approximate it. Okay. Just now. You said somebody said something. I said, why is it ten point five? Uh, uh three point five plus seven. It's ten point five. It's all because I use Excel. You know, Excel we still had based on the normal figure. No, I put ten point two three. Uh uh. Oh yeah, madam. Oh yeah, madam. Let me explain something. Let me explain something. This I'm about to explain, you may not see it anywhere. It was because of solving question upon question that I discovered it as well. Let me tell you, tell you something. What I did to get 3.5, I did 9% multiply by, multiply by 15 divided by 39. What is this figure? Can you tell me this figure? <clears throat> oh yeah, now somebody should talk to me. It's three point four. Okay. Now look at it. For me to approximate, for me to approximate, after the point, I'm having zero again. After zero, I'm having three. After three, I'm having four. After four, I'm having six. Six is greater than five. And we assume that six to be one and add it back to four. If I add it back to four, what will it give me? It give me three zero, point zero, three, four, five. That is the principle. Let me now show you this one. I will say 11% multiplied by 24 divided by 39. Look at what this one gave me. It gave me 0 0.67. 67 is approximately 0 0.07. And that's it. Approximately 0 0.07. So if I had this guy too, if you had it based on Excel, Excel will still give you 10.2 something. Because Excel is not seeing this figure as 0 0.35 only. As I seen is like 0 0.35, 0 0.34, something, 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 something. So for you to get it, you need to use your normal calculator by saying 0 0.035 plus 0 0.07. That's it. When I change it to percentage, it gives you 10.5. 10 10 That's it. Are you fine? Please, why don't we have effective interest rates in this question? I don't need effective interest rate in this question. Whenever it is provided, please use EIR. Use EIR. So in what situation do we have um, EIR in this question? Let me just tell you something. Whenever the borrowings is more than one source, in most cases, examiner will not give you EIR. Look at how many borrowings am I having here? Two borrowings. And what do I need? I need the weighted average cost of, of borrowing. 
in most cases, examiner will not give you EI have when the borrowing is more than one source. But when the borrowing is exactly one, examiner can give you EIR, and they can also give you a question without EIR. But when the examiner gives you a question with EIR, please use EIR, and that's the principle. Shall we find? Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. So we can see we, we can see communicate on on our group chat. Mr. Said, yes. Are you sending this Excel right now? I will send this right now. All right, thank you. So when are you going to send the solutions of the other ones? Ah, you know I need to sit down to prepare the solution now. Before the end of this week, I will do that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Said. <Asahi. laughs> yes. Okay. This one you are going to sit down to prepare the solution. I wonder what to do when you want to send the slides as well. Please give us the borrowing cost slide. And the slide. Borrowing cost. Yeah, borrowing cost and so please send the slides. And the first slide. All the slides. Everything in investment property. Borrowing cost and investment property. Ah, right, it be no. And the Excel too. <laughs> ah, it be no. <laughs> today is even different. Mr. Ah, today is fantastic. I have really enjoyed him. <laughs> he was not afraid at all today. He trusts us now. <laughs> <laughs> I was no, going to say the same thing. <laughs> eh? No, it's like you're fire. not afraid. <laughs> you didn't at all. In fact, he made the class so enjoyable today. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, sir. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it's our maybe it's our <laughs> parting gift as the last day of um, class. And this is the normal side. This is normal side. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your real this is your real self. <laughs> yeah, it's my real self. All right. So nice. I, I I can actually see that you guys are maybe because of the fact that the exam is very close. I can see that you guys are prepared. You, guys you are getting are you are getting like positive vibes positive. from us. Right? Yeah, yes, I can I can see positive response. Question that are making sense. Question that are really making sense. Okay, well, no color. I wish you best of luck. Congrats in advance. We can communicate on the group chat. If you need any questions, yes. Try and do the video. No, I will. I will analysis. No, that one is certain. That one is certain. I will do the video. Okay. No, thank okay. You. Well, thank you very okay, much. Okay, and I when we call on you. No, well, we are. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, no, well, okay. best of all. Okay, now. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.